Edmund Emil Kemper III entered the world in Burbank, California, on December 18, 1948, as the middle child of Colonel Elizabeth Kemper and Edmund Emil Kemper Jr. Edmund Jr., a World War II veteran turned electrician, faced challenges with Clarnell's dissatisfaction with his occupation. In his own words, he expressed that living with Clarnell was more taxing than his wartime experiences. As a newborn weighing 13 pounds, Kemper surpassed his peers in height by the age of four. Early signs of his antisocial behavior emerged, including cruelty to animals. At the age of 10, he committed a gruesome act burying a pet cat alive, then decapitating it and mounting its head on a spike. Kemper later admitted to deriving pleasure from deceiving his family about the incident. His disturbing actions escalated at the age of 13 when he killed another family cat, storing pieces of it in his closet. Kemper's dark fantasies and morbid imagination were evident in his youth. He engaged in disturbing rites involving his younger sister's dolls, removing their heads and hands. He also revealed unsettling childhood games such as gas chamber and electric chair, where he had his sister tie him up and act out imaginary executions. Despite having near-death experiences, including attempts by his elder sister to harm him, Kemper maintained a close relationship with his father. However, the family separation in 1957 and subsequent divorce in 1961 devastated him. Sent to live with his mother Clarnell in Helena, Montana, Kemper faced a dysfunctional relationship characterized by her neurotic, domineering, and abusive behavior. Clarnell's actions, such as making Kemper sleep in a locked basement, mocking his size, and belittling him, contributed to a tumultuous environment. At 14, Kemper ran away in an attempt to reconcile with his father in Van Nuys, California. Discovering that his father had remarried, he was sent to live with his paternal grandparents in North Fork, enduring an unpleasant experience due to a strained relationship with his grandparents. The tumultuous dynamics within Kemper's family set the stage for the troubled path he would later tread. On August 27, 1964, at the tender age of 15, Kemper engaged in a horrifying act that would mark a tragic turning point in his life. A heated argument with his grandmother, Maud Matilda, Huey, Kemper, let him to storm off in anger. Seething with rage, Kemper retrieved a rifle gifted to him by his grandfather for hunting. Re-entering the kitchen, he callously shot his grandmother in the head, with her purportedly uttering, Oh, you'd better not be shooting the birds again as her last words. Some accounts also suggest that she suffered additional post-mortem stab wounds from a kitchen knife. Kemper's macabre actions didn't end there. As his grandfather, Edmund Emil Kemper Sr., returned from a grocery errand, Kemper ambushed him in the driveway, fatally shooting him next to his car. Unsure of his next steps, Kemper called his mother for guidance, who advised him to contact the local police. Complying with her instructions, he awaited arrest, seemingly detached from the gravity of his gruesome deeds. In the aftermath of his arrest, Kemper chillingly confessed that he merely wanted to experience the sensation of killing his grandmother. He testified that he murdered his grandfather to spare him the anguish of discovering his wife's death, anticipating the wrath he would face for his own actions. Psychiatrist Donald Lund, who later interviewed Kemper during adulthood, noted that, in his own twisted way, Kemper saw the murders as a form of avenging the rejection he had experienced from both his father and mother. The shocking nature of Kemper's crimes, especially considering his youth, left experts bewildered. Court psychiatrists diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia, leading to his confinement in Atascadero State Hospital, a maximum security facility in San Luis Obispo County specifically designed for mentally ill convicts. The trajectory of Kemper's life had taken a dark and irreversible turn, foreshadowing the disturbing path he would continue to walk. During his time at Atascadero, there was a notable discrepancy between the diagnoses provided by California Youth Authority psychiatrists and social workers and those given by court-appointed psychiatrists. The former argued that Kemper exhibited no signs of major mental disorders, citing his lack of flight of ideas, interference with thought, delusions, hallucinations, or bizarre thinking. Instead, they found him to be intelligent and introspective, with initial IQ testing revealing a score of 136, over two standard deviations above the average. 
subsequent testing later yielded an even higher result of 145. This difference in assessment led to a revised diagnosis for Kemper, now categorized with a less severe condition labeled as a personality trait disturbance, passive-aggressive type. His demeanor and behavior as a model prisoner further endeared him to the psychiatrists at Atascadero. Kemper not only adhered to institutional rules but also took on the responsibility of administering psychiatric tests to fellow inmates. A psychiatrist remarked on his exceptional work ethic, stating, he was a very good worker, and this is not typical of a sociopath. He really took pride in his work. In an intriguing turn, Kemper became a member of the JCs during his time at Atascadero. Additionally, he asserted that he had contributed to the development of new tests and scales on the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, including an overt hostility scale, through collaboration with the institution's psychiatrists. It was during this period that Kemper claimed to have acquired the ability to understand and manipulate the tests, acknowledging that he learned valuable insights from the sex offenders he assessed. This phase in Kemper's life painted a complex picture, showcasing his intelligence, adaptability, and an uncanny ability to navigate within the confines of the psychiatric system. Little did anyone anticipate the dark path that lay ahead for this seemingly cooperative and intellectually gifted inmate. On December 18th, 1969, Kemper celebrated his 21st birthday with a release from parole at Atascadero, despite the hospital psychiatrist's reservations. Against their recommendations, he was placed under the care of his mother Clarnell, now residing in Aptis, California. Despite previous remarriages and divorces, Clarnell remained a central figure in Kemper's life. Demonstrating his rehabilitation, Kemper had his juvenile records expunged on November 29. 1972, attesting to his apparent successful response to years of treatment and rehabilitation. During his stay with his mother, Kemper attended community college, aiming to fulfill parole requirements and pursue his ambition of becoming a police officer. Despite being rejected due to his imposing stature, standing at 6 feet 9 inches, he maintained ties with Santa Cruz police officers and became a regular presence at the jury room, a local bar frequented by law enforcement. Unable to realize his policing aspirations, Kemper worked various menial jobs before securing employment with the State of California Division of Highways. Despite his efforts to build a new life, his relationship with Clarnell remained tumultuous, marked by frequent, audible arguments. Kemper recounted the intensity of these clashes, revealing that even mundane topics could escalate into violent verbal battles. Eventually, Kemper managed to move out and live with a friend in Alameda attempting to distance himself from his contentious relationship with his mother. However, financial difficulties compelled him to frequently return to her apartment in Aptis. In his early 20s, Kemper became engaged to a female student from Turlock High School, a relationship that endured over a year before being terminated due to his second arrest. The identity of the young woman was kept confidential upon her parents' request. In the same period, while working for the highway division, Kemper faced a life-altering event when he was hit by a car while riding his recently purchased motorcycle. The accident resulted in a badly injured arm and a $15,000 settlement from a civil suit filed against the driver. Armed with part of this settlement, he acquired a 1969 Ford Galaxy, and it was during this time that he began noticing and picking up young women hitchhiking. Initially, Kemper claimed to have released around 150 hitchhikers peacefully, adhering to a specific pattern. However, his behavior took a dark turn as he started experiencing what he referred to as little zapples, homicidal sexual urges. Blaming some of the women he later killed for hitchhiking, Kemper expressed frustration with what he perceived as a flaunting of societal norms. This marked the ominous prelude to the chilling acts that would later define his criminal notoriety. Between May 1972 and April 1973, Edmund Kemper committed a series of gruesome murders, claiming the lives of eight individuals. His victims were predominantly female students hitchhiking, whom he would lure to isolated areas, including five college students, one high school student, his mother, and his mother's best friend. Kemper's chilling acts during this 11-month spree involved shooting, stabbing, smothering, or strangling his victims. Following the killings, he would take their bodies to his home, where he engaged in horrifying acts such as decapitation, 
Irimatio with their severed heads, necrophilia, and dismemberment. Kemper admitted in interviews that he often targeted victims after having arguments with his mother, who refused to introduce him to women at the university where she worked. He recounted his mother's disparaging remarks, stating, You're just like your father. You don't deserve to get to know them. Psychiatrists and Kemper himself have suggested that these young women served as surrogates for his ultimate target, his mother. One of his earliest victims during this spree was Mary and Pesci and Anita Lucessa, two 18-year-old hitchhiking students from Fresno State University. On May 7, 1972, Kemper picked them up under the false pretense of taking them to Stanford University. Driving for an hour, he diverted the route to a secluded wooded area near Alameda. There, he handcuffed Pesci and locked Lucessa in the trunk before proceeding to stab and strangle Pesci to death, then repeating the same method with Lucessa. Kemper later confessed to an unsettling detail during the abduction, acknowledging that he brushed against Pesci's breast, expressing embarrassment, and apologizing before her murder. Choosing his victims based on perceived class distinctions, Kemper viewed these women as belonging to a higher social class than others he deemed unworthy. After the murders, he transported the bodies in his Ford Galaxy to his apartment, where he engaged in necrophilic acts before dismembering the corpses. Evading suspicion during a police stop for a broken taillight, he successfully concealed the bodies from authorities. Kemper disposed of the victims' remains in plastic bags near Loma Prieta Mountain, and later engaged in further desecration by placing their severed heads in a ravine after performing Irimatio on both. Despite extensive searches, only Pesci's skull was recovered in August of that year, while Lucessa's remains remained elusive. The horrifying details of Kemper's actions during this period underscore the depth of his depravity and the tragic loss of innocent lives. On the evening of September 14, 1972, Kemper picked up a 15-year-old dance student named Aiko Ku, who had decided to hitchhike to a dance class after missing her bus. He again drove to a remote area, where he pulled a gun on Ku before accidentally locking himself out of his car. However, Ku led him back inside, despite the fact that the gun was still in the car. Back inside the car, he proceeded to choke her unconscious, rape her, and kill her. Kemper subsequently packed Ku's body into the trunk of his car and went to a nearby bar to have a few drinks, then returned to his apartment. He later confessed that after exiting the bar, he opened the trunk of his car, admiring, his, catch like a fisherman. Back at his apartment, he had sexual intercourse with the corpse, then dismembered and disposed of the remains in a similar manner as his previous two victims. Ku's mother called the police to report the disappearance of her daughter and put up hundreds of flyers asking for information, but she did not receive any responses regarding her daughter's location or status. On January 7, 1973, Kemper, who had moved back in with his mother, was driving around the Cabrillo College campus when he picked up 18-year-old student Cynthia and Cindy Shaw. He drove to a wooded area and fatally shot her with a .22 caliber pistol. He then placed her body in the trunk of his car and drove to his mother's house, where he kept her body hidden in a closet in his room overnight. When his mother left for work the next morning, he had sexual intercourse with and removed the bullet from Shaw's corpse, then dismembered and decapitated her in his mother's bathtub. Kemper kept Shaw's severed head for several days, regularly engaging in Aramatio with it, then buried it in his mother's garden facing upward toward her bedroom. After his arrest, he stated that he did this because his mother always wanted people to look up to her. He discarded the rest of Shaw's remains by throwing them off a cliff. Over the course of the following few weeks, all except Shaw's head and right hand were discovered and pieced together like a macabre jigsaw puzzle. A pathologist determined that Shaw had been cut into pieces with a power saw. On February 5, 1973, after a heated argument with his mother, Kemper left his house in search of possible victims. With heightened suspicion of a serial killer preying on hitchhikers in the Santa Cruz area, students had been advised to accept rides only from cars with university stickers on them. Kemper was able to obtain a sticker, as his mother worked at UCSC. He separately encountered 23-year-old Rosalind Heather Thorpe and 20-year-old Alice Helen Allison Liu on the UCSC campus. According to Kemper, he first encountered Thorpe as she exited a building, having attended a lecture.
Thorpe entered the front passenger seat and, believing Kemper to be a fellow student, began chatting amiably as he drove. Shortly thereafter, he observed Lou, whom he described as a small Chinese girl, thumbing a ride. Kemper stopped his vehicle, and Lou entered the back seat of his car. Shortly thereafter, Kemper slowed his vehicle, then shot Thorpe in the head with a .22 pistol. He then turned toward Lou as she cowered and squirmed in the back seat of his car. His first two shots missed the terrified girl, although his third bullet hit her in the temple. Their bodies were then wrapped in blankets. Kemper again brought his victims' bodies back to his mother's house, this time he beheaded them in his car and carried the headless corpses into his mother's house to have sexual intercourse with them. He then dismembered the bodies, removed the bullets to prevent identification, and discarded their remains the next morning. Some remains were found at Eden Canyon a week later, and more were found near Route 1 in March. When questioned in an interview as to why he decapitated his victims, he explained, the head trip fantasies were a bit like a trophy. You know, the head is where everything is at, the brain, eyes, mouth. That's the person. I remember being told as a kid, you cut off the head and the body dies. The body is nothing after the head is cut off. Well, that's not quite true, there's a lot left in the girl's body without the head. On April 20th, 1973, Kemper was roused from sleep by the return of his mother, Clonel Strandberg, from a party. As she settled in her bed to read, Kemper entered her room, and a brief exchange occurred. Clonel remarked, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. Kemper replied, No, good night. Waiting for her to sleep, he stealthily re-entered her room, attacking her with a claw hammer and a penknife to slit her throat. The brutality escalated as he beheaded her and later, as he admitted in a 1984 interview, humiliated her corpse. Kemper recounted placing her head on a shelf, screaming at it, throwing darts, and ultimately smashing her face in. Additionally, he cut out her tongue and larynx, attempting to dispose of them in the garbage disposal, an act that symbolically echoed the years of verbal abuse he endured from his mother. Concealing his mother's corpse in a closet, Kemper went to a nearby bar to drink. Upon returning, he invited his mother's best friend, 59-year-old Sarah Taylor Sally Hallett, over for dinner and a movie. Kemper, however, strangled Hallett to death upon her arrival, placing her lifeless body in a closet alongside Clarnell's. In an attempt to mislead the authorities, he left a note reading, Acts. 5.15 a.m. Saturday. No need for her to suffer any more at the hands of this horrible murderous butcher. Dot. Subsequently, Kemper fled the scene, driving nonstop to Pueblo, Colorado, fueled by caffeine pills to stay awake. Armed with three guns and hundreds of rounds of ammunition, he believed he was the subject of an active manhunt. In Pueblo, after not hearing news about the murders on the radio, he called the police booth. Initially, the police did not take him seriously, instructing him to call back later. Hours later, Kemper called again, requesting to speak with an officer he knew personally. This time, he confessed to the murders of his mother and Hallett, patiently awaiting the police to apprehend him. In custody, Kemper also confessed to the six student murders. Reflecting on why he turned himself in during a later interview, Kemper expressed the futility of his actions, stating, the original purpose was gone. It wasn't serving any physical or real or emotional purpose. It was just a pure waste of time. Emotionally, I couldn't handle it much longer. Toward the end there, I started feeling the folly of the whole damn thing, and at the point of near exhaustion, near collapse, I just said to hell with it and called it all off. Kemper faced indictment on eight counts of first-degree murder on May 7, 1973. His defense attorney, Jim Jackson, assigned by the chief public defender of Santa Cruz County, had little recourse due to Kemper's detailed and explicit confession. Faced with limited options, the defense pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. During his time in custody, Kemper attempted suicide twice. The trial commenced on October 23, 1973. Despite three court-appointed psychiatrists attesting to Kemper's legal sanity, Dr. Joel Fort delved into his juvenile records and passed diagnosis of psychosis. Fort, even after interviewing Kemper under truth serum, 
claimed that Kemper had engaged in cannibalism, slicing flesh from his victim's legs and consuming it. However, Ford asserted that Kemper was fully aware of his actions and relished the notoriety associated with being a murderer. Kemper later recanted the confession of cannibalism. California applied the Amnan standard, requiring proof that the defendant, due to a mental disease, did not comprehend the nature and quality of their actions or, if they did, did not understand that it was wrong. Kemper appeared to know the wrongfulness of his acts and exhibited signs of malice aforethought. Taking the stand on November 1, 1973, Kemper testified that he killed the victims to possess them, akin to possessions. He sought to persuade the jury that his actions stemmed from an aberrant mind, claiming two beings inhabited his body, and when the killer personality emerged, it was like blacking out. After five hours of deliberation on November 8, 1973, the jury declared Kemper sane and guilty on all counts. Despite his request for the death penalty, the Supreme Court of California's moratorium on capital punishment led to a sentence of seven years to life for each count, served concurrently. Kemper was sentenced to the California Medical Facility in Vacaville. During Kemper's trial for the murder of his grandparents, court-appointed psychiatrists diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia. However, this diagnosis was contested by California Youth Authority psychiatrists and social workers at Atascadero State Hospital. They argued that Kemper displayed no flight of ideas, no interference with thought, no expression of delusions or hallucinations, and no evidence of bizarre thinking. Instead, they found him highly intelligent and introspective, leading to a re-diagnosis of personality trait disturbance, passive-aggressive type. Upon his transfer to the California Medical Facility in 1973, Kemper underwent re-evaluation by psychiatrists, resulting in a new diagnosis. He was now classified with antisocial, narcissistic, and schizotypal personality disorders, reflecting a shift in the understanding of his mental health. This complex web of diagnoses highlights the challenges in comprehending and categorizing the intricacies of Kemper's psychological profile. While at the California Medical Facility, Kemper shared a prison block with infamous criminals like Herbert Mullen and Charles Manson. Kemper harbored a particular disdain for Mullen, considering him a senseless killer. He recounted manipulating and intimidating Mullen, even resorting to behavior modification techniques by rewarding him with peanuts for compliant behavior. Despite his chilling history, Kemper has maintained a relatively positive standing within the prison system. He has actively engaged in various activities, scheduling psychiatric appointments for fellow inmates, showcasing his talents as a skilled ceramic craftsman, and contributing to audiobook narrations for visually impaired individuals. However, his active roles were cut short in 2015 after suffering a stroke and being declared medically disabled. In 2016, he received his first rules violation for failing to provide a urine sample. Throughout his incarceration, Kemper has granted numerous interviews, participating in documentaries like The Killing of America, 1982, and Murder, No Apparent Motive, 1984. These interviews have provided valuable insights into the minds of serial killers. FBI profiler John Douglas commended Kemper's intelligence and rare insight for a violent criminal, describing him as friendly, open, sensitive, and possessing a good sense of humor. Kemper, forthright about the nature of his crimes, states that his involvement in interviews aims to prevent others with similar urges from acting on them. He emphasizes the importance of seeking help for those struggling with violent thoughts. Despite being eligible for parole multiple times, Kemper has been consistently denied, with the most recent denial in 2017. His next parole eligibility is in 2024. In the quiet corners of South Carolina's history lies a chilling tale of darkness and depravity. A story that delves into the twisted mind of a man whose name still sends shivers down the spine of those who remember. This is the story of Donald Henry P. Wee Gaskins Jr., a name synonymous with terror and brutality. Born Donald Henry Parrott Jr. on March 13, 1933, Pee Wee Gaskins led a life marked by violence, cruelty, 
and a thirst for the unthinkable. As we navigate through the layers of his troubled past, we uncover a series of heinous crimes that would shock a nation. Gaskins was not merely a serial killer, he was a master of macabre methods, stabbing, shooting, drowning, and poisoning, claiming the lives of more than a dozen people. But what led him down this path of darkness? What fueled the mind of a man who showed no mercy? Before the murders that would define him, Gaskins left a trail of criminal activities, with convictions for assault, burglary, and statutory rape. Yet, it was his connection to the disappearance of a 13-year-old girl, Kim Gelkins, that unraveled the horrifying truth. Police, in their search for the missing girl, stumbled upon a gruesome discovery, eight bodies buried in shallow graves near Gaskins' home in Prospect, South Carolina. The courtroom drama that followed showcased the sinister reality of Gaskins' actions. A jury's swift decision sentenced him to death by the electric chair, but it was a sentence that would be overturned, leading to a shocking twist in the narrative. Instead of facing a new trial, Gaskins made a chilling confession, pleading guilty to the murders that haunted his community. Imprisoned at Central Correctional Institution in Columbia, South Carolina, Gaskins's dark legacy persisted. Behind bars, he orchestrated another murder, this time with explosive consequences. As we delve into the depths of his crimes, we uncover the disturbing details of his life within prison walls and the additional death sentence he received. In a desperate bid for notoriety, Gaskins claimed to have killed 110 people, a statement that has since been discredited by law enforcement and journalists. Yet, in sworn testimony as part of a plea agreement, he confirmed the murders of 13 individuals between 1970 and 1975. Join us on this harrowing journey as we piece together the fragments of a disturbed mind and the darkness that consumed the life of Donald Henry P. Wee Gaskins Jr. unravel the mystery, explore the psychology, and confront the chilling reality of a man who became the embodiment of evil. This is the untold story of Pee Wee Gaskins, the South Carolina Nightmare. Donald Henry Gaskins, born in Florence County, South Carolina, to Yulia Parrott, found himself as the last in a line of Parrott's illegitimate children. Despite his small stature, earning him the moniker Pee Wee, Gaskins stood between 5 feet 4 inches, 1.63 meters, and 5 feet 5 inches, 1.65 meters, weighing approximately 130 pounds, 59 kilograms. His early life unfolded in an environment marked by a significant lack of attention from his mother and abuse from a male relative. Surprisingly, Gaskins only became aware of his given name, Donald, during his initial court appearance. Widely acknowledged as a master manipulator and street-smart con artist, Gaskins was noted for his keen sense of humor and a friendly, entertaining personality. When he was one year old, Gaskins reportedly drank a bottle of kerosene which caused him to have convulsions until age three. In adolescence, Gaskins engaged in a violent crime spree with a group of fellow delinquents which included burglaries, assaults, and a gang rape. At age 13, Gaskins was convicted of assaulting a young woman by hitting her in the head with an axe when she caught him breaking into her family home. He was sentenced to five years in a reform school, the South Carolina Industrial School for White Boys in Florence, where he was regularly raped by his fellow inmates. After escaping from the reform school, getting married and voluntarily returning to complete his sentence, Gaskins was released in 1951 at the age of 18. He briefly worked on a tobacco plantation until he was arrested in 1953 for attacking a teenage girl with a hammer over an alleged insult. He was sentenced to six years' imprisonment at the South Carolina Penitentiary. There, Gaskins earned his fellow inmates respect by killing the most feared man in the prison, Hazel Brazell, in what Gaskins claimed was self-defense. As a result, Gaskins received an extra three years in prison for involuntary manslaughter but from that point on he became the aggressor instead of the victim. He escaped from prison in 1955 by hiding in the back of a garbage truck and fled to Florida, where he took employment with a traveling carnival. He was rearrested, remanded to custody, and paroled in August 1961. Following his release from prison, Gaskins reverted to committing burglaries and fencing stolen property. Two years after his parole, he was arrested for the rape of a 12-year-old girl, but absconded while awaiting sentence. 
Gaskins was rearrested in Georgia and sentenced to eight years of imprisonment. He was paroled again in November 1968. Upon his release, Gaskins moved to the town of Sumter, South Carolina, and began work with a roofing company. Gaskins recounted his first non-prison-related murder, targeting a blonde female hitchhiker in September 1969. He admitted to torturing and killing her before disposing of the body in a swamp, expressing a disturbing sense of unrestrained power in his memoirs, all I could think about is how I could do anything I wanted to her. This marked the inception of a horrifying pattern, as he claimed to have picked up and killed numerous victims while traversing the coastal highways of the American South. Termed coastal kills, Gaskins revealed that these acts were driven purely by pleasure, occurring approximately once every six weeks during his hunting expeditions to alleviate his feelings of bothersomeness. He confessed to tormenting and mutilating his victims, attempting to prolong their suffering. Gaskins admitted to using various methods, including stabbing, suffocation, mutilation, and even cannibalism. While he later confessed to killing 80 to 90 such victims, these statements have never been independently verified. Inconsistencies emerge in his memoirs, where he initially claimed to commit coastal kills every six weeks but later stated feeling an overwhelming urge to commit such acts by the tenth day of each calendar month. Specific individuals were named among Gaskin's serious murders, including an African-American couple, Eddie and Bertie Brown, aged 24 and 20, respectively, murdered in 1972. He buried them behind the tenant house, a location vaguely described in his autobiography. Another victim, Horace Jones, 40, met his demise in 1974, according to Gaskins. However, skepticism arises as there is no evidence supporting Gaskins' claims of additional murders beyond Hazel Brazell and the 14 victims listed below. These victims' bodies have been found, identified, and their deaths corroborated by law enforcement records and Gaskins' sworn testimony. In November 1970, Gaskins committed the first of a series of confirmed murders, primarily people whom he knew and killed for personal reasons. His first confirmed victims were his own niece, Janice Kirby, aged 15, and her friend, Patricia and Allsbrook, aged 17, both of whom he beat to death. He said he was enraged at their drug abuse, while others say he was attempting to sexually assault them in Sumter. Gaskins claims to have poisoned Martha and Dix Jr., also known as Clyde, 20, in March 1971 or 1972, either because of a rumor P. We was the father of her unborn child. She generally dated only women but was known to mess around with men from time to time, or out of revenge because she was an alleged drug dealer who supplied Kirby and Allsbrook or because she got married and left for Texas to be with her wife. Her bones were found in a ditch, but lost when given to a university to study. Gaskins was an overt racist and he raped and drowned both Doreen Hope Dempsey, 22, and her two-year-old daughter Robin Michelle Dempsey in June 1973. Gaskins had befriended Doreen Dempsey several years prior and was angry upon hearing she had become pregnant a second time with an African-American man. She had been living with Gaskins's friend Johnny Sellers and his brother Carl Sellers in North Charleston, South Carolina. They brought her to Gaskins's home in Prospect and left her there to speak with Gaskins about staying with him for a short time while she was pregnant. Upset that Doreen was having a second biracial child, Gaskins responded by walking her to his backyard pond where he drowned both the mother and her toddler. In June 1974, Gaskins shot his friend and criminal associate Johnny Sellers, age 36, in the back of the head, and stabbed to death Johnny's ex-girlfriend Jesse Ruth Judy, age 22, after Sellers asked for money he was owed from the sale of a stolen boat. Gaskins feared Sellers would reveal Gaskins's involvement in the boat theft and sale. Gaskins was also involved in an auto theft ring. Jesse Judy was murdered at the same time because she could have told police about Gaskins's criminal activities, including murdering her boyfriend, Johnny Sellers. Silas Barnwell Yates, age 45, was murdered in February 1975 by having his throat slit in a murder-for-hire scheme. The forensics showed it was by knife, but Gaskins disputed this, saying it was done by karate chop. Yates was in a dispute with his ex-girlfriend Suzanne Kipper Owens, and she and her husband John Owens paid Gaskins $1,500 to murder Yates. 
Diane Bellamy Neely, age 25, was separated from her husband Walter Neely, who was one of Gaskins' closest friends and a criminal co-conspirator. On April 10, 1975, Gaskins stabbed to death Diane Bellamy and shot dead her boyfriend Avery Leroy Howard, age 34. Among other reasons, Gaskins murdered Diane Bellamy because she had threatened to report to police that Gaskins was allowing underage teenagers to have sex in his home. Avery Howard was murdered because he asked for money to pay attorneys and cover legal expenses following his arrest for fraud and auto theft. Gaskins worried Avery Howard would tell police about Gaskins's criminal activities. Kim Gelkins, age 13, was stabbed to death to keep her from telling police Gaskins had moved her from North Charleston without permission, and to keep her from telling police she was being sexually abused by several adult men, including Gaskins. Dennis Bellamy, age 27, and John Henry Knight, age 15, were half-brothers, and Diane Bellamy was their sister. Within minutes of each other, Gaskins shot the two brothers in the back of the head on October 10, 1975. Gaskins had promised to pay Dennis Bellamy for some stolen guns. When confronted by Bellamy at Gaskins's trailer home in Prospect, South Carolina, he responded by offering to return the guns from the woods behind his home. He took Bellamy into the woods to retrieve the guns, but murdered him instead. John Henry Knight was directed to the same area, allegedly to meet his brother, but was also murdered to ensure he could never speak of the crimes. Rudolf Tyner, age 23, was on death row in CCI prison for a March 1978 double murder when he was murdered by Gaskins on September 12, 1982. Tyner was appealing his own death sentence after being convicted of robbing a Moles Inlet convenience store and killing store owners Bill and Myrtle Moon on March 18, 1978. The Moon's son, Tony Chimo, hired Gaskins for $2,000 to kill Rudolf Tyner because in Chimo's view, the appeals process was taking too long. Tony Chimo asked Gaskins what he needed to kill Tyner, then Gaskins told him to insert some C4 inside the heel of a shoe and mail it to him. This way Gaskins obtained plastic explosives with a blasting cap, a long wire, and a radio speaker to create an imitation intercom speaker that Tyner put to his ear to test. Gaskins then detonated the makeshift bomb by plugging the wire into a prison cell power outlet. In November 1975, Gaskins faced arrest after a criminal associate, Walter Neely, disclosed to the police his awareness of Gaskins' involvement in the deaths of Dennis Bellamy, age 28 and Johnny Knight, age 15. Neely admitted that Gaskins had shared details of killing several individuals reported as missing over the past five years and had revealed the locations where he buried them. On December 4, 1975, Neely guided the police to a plot of land near Gaskins' residence in Prospect. There, law enforcement uncovered the remains of eight victims. Gaskins faced trial for one murder charge on May 24, 1976, and was found guilty on May 28, receiving a death sentence. However, this was later commuted to life imprisonment due to changes in the South Carolina General Assembly's 1974 ruling on capital punishment, aligning with U.S. Supreme Court guidelines for the death penalty in other states. On September 2, 1982, Gaskins committed another murder while incarcerated in the high-security block at the South Carolina Correctional Institution, earning him the moniker Meanest Man in America. He killed death row inmate Rudolf Tyner, who had received his sentence for murdering an elderly couple during a failed armed robbery. Gaskins was hired for this murder by Tony Chimo, the son of Tyner's victims. Chimo initially faced murder charges but pled guilty to lesser offenses, serving eight years in prison before being paroled in 1986. Gaskins attempted to kill Tyner through unsuccessful poison attempts before resorting to explosives. He rigged a device in Tyner's cell, convincing him it would facilitate communication between cells. Following Gaskins' instructions, Tyner unwittingly held a speaker, loaded with C4 plastic explosive, to his ear, resulting in his death. Gaskins remarked, the last thing he, Tyner, heard was me laughing. Subsequently, Gaskins was tried for Tyner's murder and received a death sentence. This marked the first time in South Carolina's history that a white man was sentenced to death for the murder of a black man. While on death row, Gaskins claimed responsibility for 100 to 110 murders, 
including that of Margaret Peg Catino, the 13-year-old daughter of South Carolina State Senator James Catino Jr. of Sumter. These claims have been widely disputed, with no evidence supporting Gaskins' statements. Gaskins was executed on September 6, 1991, at 1.10 a.m. in the electric chair, hours after attempting suicide by slitting his wrists. His last words were, I'll let my lawyers talk for me. I'm ready to go. of criminal history, some names send shivers down the spine, leaving an indelible mark on the darkest corners of society. Today, we delve into the chilling tale of a man whose heinous acts sent shockwaves through the criminal justice system. Meet Gerald Stano, a name synonymous with the macabre, a figure whose life and crimes will leave you questioning the boundaries of humanity. Gerald Stano, the notorious serial killer, terrorized communities across the United States leaving a trail of devastation in his wake. Join us on a riveting journey as we unravel the twisted psyche of a man who prowled the shadows, leaving a legacy of fear and despair. In the tranquil town of Schenectady, New York, on a September 12, 1951, a baby named Paul Zaninger entered the world. Little did anyone know, this innocent beginning would unravel into a tale of darkness and despair. Born as the fifth child to his mother, Paul faced early hardships that cast a long shadow over his formative years. His mother, burdened by circumstances, made a heart-wrenching decision to give him up for adoption at just six months old. County doctors, assessing Paul's condition, delivered a grim prognosis. They deemed him to be functioning at what can only be described as an animalistic level. A heartbreaking reality unfolded as young Paul resorted to unthinkable measures for survival, even resorting to consuming his own waste. Enter Norma Stano, a compassionate nurse who would become Paul's lifeline. Adopting him, she not only gave him a new home but also a new identity, Gerald Stano. Despite the loving environment provided by the Stano family, the scars of Paul's early struggles lingered. Bedwetting persisted until the age of 10 and behavioral challenges became a constant companion. Academically, Gerald faced hurdles, earning mediocre grades in all subjects except for one shining beacon, music. But beneath the surface, a darker pattern emerged, compulsive lying and deceit that would shape his troubled adolescence. At 14, the shadows deepened as Gerald found himself in trouble with the law. Arrested for a false fire alarm and later for throwing rocks at passing cars, the path towards criminality began to unfold. His journey through education was marked by delays, graduating high school at the age of 21. Even after receiving his diploma, challenges persisted as he navigated through a tumultuous work life, marked by terminations for theft and tardiness. Gerald's life took darker turns as he left a trail of stolen opportunities, yet his deviant behavior reached its peak when he impregnated a mentally disabled girl. The consequences were haunting, and Stano's parents intervened, funding a procedure that would shape the trajectory of his life. March 25, 1980 marked the turning point for Gerald Stano, culminating in his arrest after a harrowing assault on Donna Hensley. Escaping a brutal attack in a hotel room, Hensley promptly reached out to the authorities. Revealing her profession as a prostitute, she recounted a disturbing encounter that spiraled into violence. Stano, the man seeking her services, subjected her to a vicious stabbing with a knife, followed by insulting remarks before making a swift escape. Hensley's familiarity with Stano played a pivotal role as she provided crucial identification to the authorities. Officially confessing to his murderous actions, Stano admitted to initiating his killing spree in the early 1970s during his 20s. However, he asserted an even earlier commencement, claiming to have started in the late 1960s at the age of 18. Despite the disappearance of several girls in Stano's vicinity during that time, investigations conducted almost two decades later yielded insufficient physical evidence, resulting in no charges against him. His criminal activities were primarily concentrated in Florida and New Jersey. 
Stano admitted to his first murder in 1969 in New Jersey and confessed to killing six more women in Pennsylvania. Following his move to Florida, the body count may have surged to 30 or more victims, with the majority being women in vulnerable circumstances. Almost all victims, save two, were Caucasian, and the age range of his known victims spanned from 16 to 25 years old. Approaching his 29th birthday, Stano found himself behind bars, accused of the alleged murder of a staggering 41 women. In a grim twist of fate, he shared his prison days with fellow serial killer Ted Bundy until Bundy's execution in 1989. The narrative of Gerald Stano unveils a dark web of criminality, etching a haunting imprint on the pages of criminal history. The lives of several victims were tragically taken by the actions of an evil man during the years spanning 1973 to 1980. Janine Marie Ligatino, 19, and in Eugenia Arsenault, 17, were discovered brutally stabbed to death in a vacant lot in Gainesville, Florida on March 21, 1973. Barbara and Bauer, 16, met a grim fate on September 6, 1973, in Bradford County, Florida. Strangled to death, she had been abducted from a Holly Hill shopping mall. Kathy Lee Scharf, 17, a hitchhiker from Port Orange, was found on January 19, 1974, in the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge near Titusville, Florida. Fatally stabbed and strangled between December 1973 and January 1974, her life was cut short. A woman's decomposed body was discovered on November 24, 1974, behind the Interstate Mall in Altamonte, Florida. Stabbed twice, possibly sexually assaulted, she remains unidentified as the Seminole County Jane Doe. Stano confessed to her murder in 1982. Nancy Jean Hurd, 24, was found strangled near Bulow Creek Road, just north of Ormond Beach, on January 2, 1975. Diana Lynn Valak, 18, met a tragic end on May 19, 1975, shot to death in an empty lot in Wesley Chapel, Florida. Susan Basil, 12, disappeared on June 10, 1975, in Port Orange, Florida. According to Stano's 1982 confession, she was strangled, and her body was never found. Linda and Hamilton, 16, was discovered strangled, drowned, and buried in the sand near Turtle Mound State Park in New Smyrna Beach, Florida, on July 22, 1975. Emily Branch, 21, met her demise in December 1975, her strangled body found floating in Spruce Spring Creek. Susan Bickrest, 24, an aspiring cosmetologist, was kidnapped from her workplace in Daytona Beach on December 20, 1975. Bonnie Williams Hughes, 35, was found beaten to death on February 11, 1976, south of CR 546, in Winter Haven, Florida. Ramona Cheryl Neal, 18, was found concealed with branches in Tomoka State Park on May 29, 1976. Joan Gale Foster, 18, and Emily Grieve, 39, were both found shot multiple times on September 28, 1977, and October 21, 1977, respectively, in Pasco County, Florida. Phoebe Winston, 23, went missing on October 28, 1977, in Plant City, Florida. Her skeletal remains were found on March 27. 1979, in Lakeland. Kathleen Mary Muldoon, 23, was beaten and shot, her body discovered in a drainage ditch on November 11, 1977. Sandra Dubose, 35, was found shot to death on a deserted road near Daytona Beach in Brevard County on August 5, 1978. Christine Goodson, 16, was found dead on April 15, 1979, in Pinellas County, Florida. The cause of her death remains undisclosed. Dorothy Williams, 17, was discovered stabbed and beaten to death behind the Holiday Inn on Northdale Mabry Highway in Tampa, Florida, on December 12, 1979. Mary Carol Marr, 20, was abducted on January 27, 1980, near the Daytona Beach Boardwalk and stabbed to death on December 12, 1979. 
Tony Van Haddocks, 26, a prostitute, was found dead in a wooded area in Holly Hill on April 15, 1980, with multiple stab wounds to the head. A young woman, unidentified and referred to as the Daytona Beach Jane Doe, was found with skeletal remains on November 5, 1980, in the wooded median strip of Interstate 95. Stano admitted to her murder, recalling her slogan on a shirt, Do it in the dirt. No charges were filed due to a plea agreement. The chilling saga of Gerald Stano, a man whose dark deeds cast a shadow over countless lives, reached its conclusion in the hallowed halls of justice. Found guilty of nine heinous murders, he faced the weight of the law, receiving eight life sentences and one ultimate sentence, death. On that fateful day, March 23, 1998, the stark walls of Florida State Prison bore witness to the culmination of Stano's grim journey. Strapped into the electric chair, he faced the consequences of his monstrous acts. The room, steeped in an eerie silence, awaited the inevitable. As the switch was thrown, the electric current surged, bringing an end to a life stained with unspeakable atrocities. Gerald Stano, the perpetrator of unfathomable horror, met his fate in the cold embrace of the electric chair. In his final moments, Stano's request for a poignant last meal reflected a stark contrast to the darkness that defined his existence. Delmonico steak, a baked potato adorned with sour cream and bacon bits, a salad with blue cheese dressing, lima beans, and a half gallon of mint chocolate chip ice cream served alongside two liters of Pepsi. Yet, even in the face of imminent death, Stano clung to a proclamation of innocence. His final statement, etched in the annals of his demise, shifted blame and laid bare the haunting specter of potential false confessions. Directed at the lead investigator, Paul Crow, Stano declared, I am innocent. I am frightened. I was threatened, and I was held month after month without any real legal representation. I confessed to crimes I did not commit. With these words, the curtain fell on the life and legacy of Gerald Stano, a man whose journey through darkness left scars on the fabric of time. The electric chair's final sizzle marked the end of a chapter, but the echoes of his crimes linger, a chilling reminder of the depths humanity can descend. As we reflect on this chilling tale, we're left with an unsettling question, in the pursuit of justice, how do we navigate the delicate balance between truth and the potential for coerced confessions? ensuring the guilty are held accountable while safeguarding against the miscarriage of justice.